want to check out a little bit. How many of you, just raise your hands, are familiar with the labyrinth? Just look around. So a lot of people here are familiar with the labyrinth. And uh, so whether you're familiar with the labyrinth or not, how many of you are here because you're just curious? Want to know a little bit more? Oh, come on. We should always be curious, right? <laughs> All right, good. So I like that. So our topic tonight is Walking with Jesus, the History of the Labyrinth and a Tool for Spiritual Formation. Um, so let me tell you what I uh, plan for us to do. I want to define spiritual formation because how do we know what we're even aiming for if we don't know what we're talking about? And so today we'll define spiritual formation. I'll tell you a little bit about what a labyrinth is. Um, you'll hear just a little bit of labyrinth history. I, I am not a historian, um, but I did print off a big piece of history about labyrinths, and it's on the table back there. So if you are a historian, feel free to take a look at that, um, but you will hear a little bit about the history of labyrinths. I have part of this PowerPoint presentation, some various types of labyrinths. There are a, a lot of different kinds of labyrinths. You'll see a couple of finger labyrinths up here. And in its most simplest form, a spiral is a labyrinth. So it's the easiest way to think about a labyrinth. Um, and we'll just define labyrinths in a little bit. And ultimately, why get a labyrinth here at Eastern University? So we're going to look at some ways that the labyrinth can be a vehicle for spiritual formation for our journey um, as we go through life and study together. All right, do you? Yeah. All right. So, um, my, my plan is this, to talk. <laughs> That's what they asked me to do. Your goal is to ask questions, all right? It's not ask, let's stump the professor, all right? That was last night, all right? Not tonight, though. So feel free to ask any questions. If I don't know the answer, I will um, honestly try to find out for you. I'll either make something up or I'll tell you what I know, all right? <clears throat> One of those three things should work. All right, so just raise your hand if you have a question and stop me along the way. There will also be a time at the end for question and answers. So before I switch to the next slide, I want you all to just think about something. Um, from the moment you were born to this moment right here, you don't have to answer just yet, but have any of you ever had a God moment? A moment in your life when you felt most connected or close to God? A moment when you were like, oh, God, thanks for filling me in. That's what you want me to do. Aha. Like an aha God moment. Have any of you had a moment like that? If so, just stand up real quick and look around. All right. So that's most of us. All right, great. Have a seat. All right. So I want you to think about those God moments for a second. Um, you can raise your hand this time. How many of you had those God moments in church? OK, a few of us have those moments in church. That's good. Makes us pastors feel important. That's nice. Thank you very much. How many of you have had those God moments um, in nature, walking in the woods or going for a walk somewhere? Just raise your hands. Just kind of walking around. OK. How about um, all alone? You're somewhere all alone on a beach in private, praying or meditating. OK, great. Do you all see that? All right, so God moments can happen in a lot of different places, in a lot of different ways, because what I believe to be most true is that God finds us wherever we are. Whether we're on a labyrinth, whether we're in a church, whether we're on a beach, whether we are driving in our car, God is, has a desire to connect with us. And when we're really ready to hear, I believe those things happen. God connects with us. So spiritual formation. Excuse me, friend. Sorry. Technical. Oh. Continue. Oh, good. So now I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So spiritual formation involves our growth, the growth of ourselves as a whole person. Our body, our mind, our heart, our will, it involves everything about who we are. And Dallas Willard says, for Christians, spiritual formation refers to a spirit-driven process of forming the inner world of the human self 
in such a way that it becomes like the inner being of Christ himself. Well, I think that that's our aim as we journey a Christian path. But spiritual formation is a process. So while many of you had a God moment, did you say, that's it, I'm done? <laughs> no, we continue on the path. We continue on the journey. And that, to me, is one of the gifts of the labyrinth. It's a reflection of the journey or the path. <clears throat> so what is a labyrinth? Right, this is a local labyrinth at um, a, a Quaker meeting house in, is it Wayne? And um, some of you may see yourselves there. This uh, is the committee um, to bring the labyrinth to Eastern University, uh, walking a labyrinth out there. So what is a labyrinth? <clears throat> In short, a labyrinth is a walk with Christ. I believe, as this scripture says, that there is no greater joy that God has for us than to hear us, God's children, walking in the truth. So this is a labyrinth I built um, in Delaware at the beach. Um, my friends are walking it. It was an invitation to meet God. And as soon as we finished walking the labyrinth, this woman standing on the right looked over and saw this shell with a cross on it. A God moment. I believe that God finds us where we are when we open ourselves to find God also. So, the labyrinth, what is it? The labyrinth is a sacred space. It's not in and of itself a sacred space, but it's what we bring to it that makes it sacred. And it becomes, therefore, a tool for spiritual, personal, psychological transformation, a tool for change. It's also a geometric pattern created by sacred geometry that's either walked, like you saw us doing in that other picture, or that you can trace with your finger like these wooden labyrinths up here. Now, the other thing I have to confess is my weakness, history and sacred geometry, <laughs> OK? There's a whole book on sacred geometry, but it does have this amazing on mathematical connection around sacred numbers. So if you guys are interested in that, I can give you the reference to that. The labyrinth is also unique because it has what is known as a unicursal path. That means that there is only one way in and one way out. So if you think of this spiral, if you start at the beginning, you keep walking it. You don't have to think too much about the path, and you'll end up at the center. And if you follow that same path, you'll come back out. There's no tricks. There's no dead ends. There's no mystery to walking a labyrinth. It's just a path. And what this symbol does, it combines some older symbols, the symbol of the circle, the symbol of the spiral, and the symbol of the meander, or you might be familiar with Greek keys. Do you guys know what the Greek keys are? You'll see it in a slide coming up. Uh, remind, remind me and I'll tell you. <clears throat> and ultimately, the labyrinth mirrors the patterns of our lives, the twists and the turns, the ups and the downs. So think about this. Have you ever been going along on your journey all nice and happy? And something happens. And then suddenly, there's a shift in the journey. Has that ever happened to you? Right? That, to me, is like these twists and turns in the labyrinth. It just mirrors the patterns of our lives because twists and turns happen. So it allows for healing and wholeness to take place. Oh, I keep forgetting to change this. So sorry. <clears throat> and lastly, a labyrinth is not a maze. It's different than a maze. So what's the difference? Well, a maze might have one path, but it has multiple paths that trick you. Its aim is to make you kind of figure it out. And so it engages your brain. 
So a maze makes your rational brain think. Whereas if you're on a labyrinth, it engages the other side of your brain, the creative side of your brain, and it can let go of rational thought. And it frees your brain for something else to happen. So you don't have to make any kinds of decisions, decisions, and it allows your heart to open up. You don't have to make a choice. You don't have to figure out what the trick is. There isn't any trick at all. So when you're walking a labyrinth, you can be anywhere on this labyrinth and you see that the center is your destination. Where you're going is always visible. But if you think of those hedge mages, have you ever done those like around Halloween with a haze or all of those things, right? The, the center, it's hidden. You, you don't always get to see where you're going. And that's a big difference between them too. So a labyrinth is non-threatening. You can walk without worry. You can walk <coughs> safe and trusting. I like to think of it as being held in God's arms while I'm walking because it's safe. There isn't a threat. It's not confusing. It's not frustrating. There's a clear path ahead. And what I love about the labyrinth, it's about not getting lost, but about being found. And about finding ourselves, about finding spirit and Jesus and God in the journey that we're on together. So, a little bit about some labyrinth history. The earliest labyrinths found in Europe are reported to be at least 4,000 years old. Now, I'm pretty old, but they have me beat by just a couple years, actually. Right? So, what we know about labyrinths is that they themselves predate Jesus. Right? This uh, picture on the right is the, one of the earliest examples of a labyrinth estimated to be around 2000 BC, and it's a petroglyph that was found in Spain. And if you want to see other ones there on the papers that I told you is back there around some histor histor historical labyrinths. The pattern on the labyrinth is similar to this pattern on the labyrinth, and it's called a classical labyrinth or the Cretan labyrinth because it was found in Crete. It's a Cretan labyrinth. Labyrinths are usually um, circuits, they're circles. And this one is known as a seven circuit labyrinth because if you counted it, there'd be seven rings to the center, all right? So that's, the, that's one of the oldest patterns of the labyrinth is the Cretan labyrinth. And here are some other historical labyrinths. So the um, top, is there a little, um, <gasps> what did I do? Okay, I guess there's no little pointer up here, but up on the top right is a coin from Gnosis, Greece, that's estimated to be circa 280 BCE, before Common Era. The plate on the bottom is a more contemporary, but this is when I said a meander path. These are Greek keys. So in almost every culture, you find some form of a labyrinth, and that would be the Greek labyrinth. Uh, this was found in Croatia. It's more of a medieval and Roman labyrinth. The stone on the right was found in Ireland, and that one also dates back, oh, it just says it's me medieval. It's called the Hollywood stone. And I don't have a lot of information about the picture on the right. Um, it was sent to me by a friend of mine who um, sh uh, went to Africa and found that the people in Africa were also participating in walking a uh, labyrinth in this little village that she went to. So labyrinths are found in a variety of cultures um, throughout the world. One of the most popular and uh, well-known shapes of the labyrinth is known as the Chartres Labyrinth. And those are the ones that are mirrored up here, and I believe it's the one that you are, no? Okay, forget <laughs> that. Um, so it's the Chartres Labyrinth. This labyrinth has 11 circuits. So if you count the times you'll walk around it to get to the center, it has 11 circuits to get there. 
The labyrinth was incorporated into the floors of great Gothic cathedrals in the 12th and 13th centuries. One of the most famous is this one, the Chartres labyrinth, found on the floor of the cathedral in France. And this is an actual picture of that labyrinth built of honey limestone with marble around it, and it is now over 800 years old. I uh, believe that it's open for walking every Friday evening, and there are uh, labyrinth retreats that happen there at Char Charter Cathedral. <clears throat> So, what is the connection between labyrinths and spiritual formation? Any ideas yet? <coughs> you see any connections yourselves? Guesses are good. Okay. Yes? Okay, well, let's see. So this is one of the um, historical, this is called the Man in the Maze. It's the Native American labyrinth. And the reason that it's here is because it's the first labyrinth that I met, or that met me, when I first became uh, introduced to the labyrinth. And I want to tell you a little bit about how it spoke to me. I was at a place in my life, in my early 20s, where I had to make a really challenging decision. Life had gotten really hard, and I had absolutely no idea what to do. And I was literally shopping one day, and I came across a piece of art that had a tag with this saying on it. It said, the labyrinth is representative of mankind's journey through the maze of life, back to the source, with a capital S. The maze is long and circuitous. However, however with careful observation, one will note that regardless of the way one travels, you will always reach the center. The test is to have the faith to keep going. When I read that, I felt comfort. I felt the spirit was telling me that whatever I chose to do next was going to be blessed by spirit on my journey. And it was, because the decision was for me to move to Pennsylvania, to um, take a job, and hopefully go to the University of Pennsylvania for graduate school. And when I moved here, I had absolutely no intention of being ordained as an American Baptist minister. I grew up in a Roman Catholic family. But the journey, the path, the openness, the God moment, it isn't the labyrinth that gave me that. It's the openness of being willing to hear spirit and follow the leading that allowed me to be where I am in this moment with each of you. So walking the labyrinth is a spiritual practice that quiets our mind. It opens our hearts. It grounds our body. It allows for error and forgiveness. It reminds us that we walk with others, not alone. It prepares us for transformation through meditation and prayer. And it helps us to find the way, the truth, and the life. If you walk a labyrinth, your walk will be as unique to you as you are to the Creator. Every prayer is different, every walk is different, and the labyrinth is a tool for spiritual formation so that we can make space to welcome and to nurture a relationship with the divine. I hope you find yourself and God in a labyrinth one day. So here's what we did. We defined spiritual formation. We learned what a labyrinth is. We heard a little bit of labyrinth history. We saw some various types of labyrinths, and we identified some ways that a labyrinth can be a vehicle for spiritual formation. And that, my friends, is the end. <laughs>